But Heron had more to offer the Alexandrians than just siege engines and miracle machines. He wanted to entertain them. And to do that, he chose a place where anything could happen. The theater. When you look at Heron's work, one of the things that comes across is that uh, Heron is a frustrated theater person. Really would like to be on stage doing these things uh, uh, big time, not just writing t technological tomes that nobody except other technologists would, would, uh, would look at. So by linking his work to the theater, uh, he linked up to popular culture and to a popular audience. In ancient times, theater was at the center of many people's lives. It was here that people could join together and discover new ideas and experiences. Theaters, such as this vast one at Epidaurus, Greece, still stand as a testament to their enduring popularity with the people of the classical world. This was as close as the ancients got to cinema, their very own field of dreams. Even the acoustics were precisely scientifically designed like a modern cinema's to heighten the audience's experience. For the classical world, theater was of huge importance and had been for centuries. The audiences flocked in huge numbers to the theater, which in a sense was the, the form of mass communication of the day. There, there were uh, elements of politics, culture, even religion played out before a mass audience. Of course, it was hugely attractive to Heron because he had a ready-made audience, an audience which was conditioned, and habituated almost, one might say, to going to the theater and enjoying spectacle entertainments there. Heron knew he could add to this experience. The skills he had learnt building war machines and temple illusions could finally be given free reign on a stage where anything was possible. He began by devising theatrical staging with the eerie ability to move on and off stage on its own. This is the first mechanical marvel Heron used to astound the theater audiences of ancient Alexandria. Demonstrated by Professor Caligaropoulos, it was built using Heron's original descriptions. It demonstrates how gravity can be used to make a piece of scenery move on and off stage, apparently of its own will. It is the precursor of the modern computerized scenery we see in the West End of London and New York's Broadway today. Ο Ήρων έχει περιγράψει στα βιβλία του μηχανισμούς και αυτόματα που είναι η πιο ανεπτυγμένη τεχνολογία της εποχής του. Περιγράφει κλειστά αυτόματα συστήματα, συστήματα με ανάδραση και αυτόματα θέατρα που παρουσιάζουν ένα ολό, ολόκληρες θεατρικές παραστάσεις. A compartment in the top of the device contains sand and when it was released through a series of holes, it pulled down a weight. The weight was attached to a rope, which was wound round an axle. When the rope unwound from the axle, the device moved forward. When fully unwound, a lever clicked, the weight was lifted, and the device trundled back again. Heron wrote a whole treatise about automatic theatres. The idea of the automatic theater is that it can move by itself. Automaton in Greek actually means a self-mover. Heron is quite 
interested in making absolutely sure that you make it quite small so that the audience won't suspect that there's actually a person inside the theatre running the show. A simple spindle with pegs, which made all these movements possible, was in fact one of Heron's greatest inventions. This carefully wound arrangement of pegs and ropes is what a modern computer scientist would call a program. No doubt the audiences at Alexandria's theatres marvelled at these moving sets for a while, but as Heron knew, audiences are always looking for something new to grab their attention. He had automated the set, but what about the actors? This would be his next bold step, to create an entirely automatic theatre production with automatic sets, actors and effects that would run on its own for over 20 minutes. Heron decided to automate the classic Greek tale of tragedy and bloody revenge, Nauplius. The story tells of how King Nauplius seeks revenge after his son is killed by Ajax at the close of the Trojan Wars. The play begins with 12 characters repairing a warship, all moving automatically. Below the action, the mechanics all remained hidden inside the box. Leaving the audiences astounded and intrigued to see all these wooden characters moving in unison. To complete the illusion, Heron added sounds and special effects. Scenes changed and backcloths dropped automatically, providing a new background for each piece of the action in turn. To prevent collisions between characters, the action all took place on different planes, which rose and fell at different times during the performance. Powering the whole pageant was a system of weights and ropes, sand glasses and seed hoppers, utilizing gravity to provide the required energy. The complexity of so many choreographed automatic elements was an incredible feat of engineering and ingenuity. As the ship in the story encountered a storm, Heron used an automatic thunder machine to shake some fear into the audience. The goddess Athena appears on cue to command the weather as the story reaches its climax. She causes a bolt of lightning to hit Ajax, the enemy in the story. He dies, and our hero, Nauplius, finally has his revenge. As the final sounds rang out around the theater, the first time this play was performed, the audience must have been enraptured by the spectacle in front of them. Actually making the play happen was no less miraculous than the event the audience had just witnessed. It might not be magic, but it required a mathematical genius to make it work. Timing every element of the story correctly, calculating the exact weights for balances and counterbalances, 
the speed of the cogs and the order of the scenes would baffle many engineers today and was, perhaps, miraculous in itself. The engine which drove the whole show was this hopper. It harnessed the power of gravity and was filled with either sand or seeds. The slow release of these then started the chain of events. As the seeds fell, a weight on top of them lowered. That weight then pulled a rope, which then in turn turned a spindle. This spindle was effectively the master controller. It held the program, stored in a complex system of ropes wound around pegs, which set off different aspects of the show when the rope was unwound past certain points. It triggered the individual pieces of the theater, such as this spindle which revolved to make dolphins apparently leap through the waves. This then was the genius behind Heron's automatic theater. Not just a collection of ropes, pegs and spindles, but a very early form of programmable machine, a wooden robotic controller. In Alexandrian theaters like this, crowds may once have gasped as roars of thunder and flashes of lightning emerged from the strange automatic theater on stage and reverberated around the auditorium. The theater in Alexander, I think, was at the center of the city's life. Also, and importantly, before the highly critical audience in the theatre at Alexandria, reputations were won and lost. And it's in that highly competitive context that we should see Heron of Alexandria's spectacular stage devices. These were devices meant to wow the audience. It's difficult to recapture something of their impact, but I imagine that it was like watching the first talking movies at the beginning of the 20th century. Something that would make you want to come back to the theatre, something that would make you remember Heron of Alexandria as an inventor. Heron was an entertainer and a flamboyant inventor. Whilst many of Heron's designs were intended to either impress worshippers in a temple or to entertain audiences in a theatre, some were mechanical toys or novelties built simply for amusement in the home. 